Would you open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 40. There's a couple of things that I want to say before I read these verses, and it's in reference to this testimony that I'm going to share. I want to tell you about the greatest testimony that I have ever heard about in my entire life. It happened in Illinois. It was during the testimony time when people were standing up giving popcorn testimonies. And the young girl stood up and she said, Well, you all know me. I was born and raised in this church. I've never smoked, drank, run around. I'm just thankful Jesus saved me. And she sat back down. Friend, to me, that is the testimony that God can keep someone from going the ways of the world. And the reason I tell you that is because I'm so sad to tell you that in many circles we've so blown up that God's gone out and done everything under the sun, and then he gets converted. We, we make him sometimes feel like a celebrity, and some of the teenagers have just been walking with Jesus faithfully. They feel like, well, I can't be that bold. That's not true, amen? And I'm teaching my kids this. The greatest testimony is that one that just stays faithful to Jesus Christ. And it's my contention. I believe they can be more faith, rather more effective in the kingdom of God by never doing a bunch of sins. Well, we're getting a few amens. <laughs> uh, let, let me say it this way, and, and I'm making this point for the teenagers here tonight. How many of you were, now I know we're all saved from sin, but I mean how many of you did things you're really not proud of and tonight you know your sins are washed away. You know your sins are under the blood. There's no condemnation in your heart. But to this very day, you still fight the memories from those past sins. How many are like that here tonight? Well, sure, many of us. And the truth is, a few more might want to raise their hand. You understand my point. I'm not going to stop and talk about it tonight, but you better believe there's very rarely a week goes by that I don't have some memory. Oh, I know I'm forgiven. I'm not condemned by it. I know it's under the blood of Jesus. But if I would have never committed that sin, I'd be just a little more freer. You understand my point. That's why I tell young people everywhere I go, they can be more effective in the kingdom of God by just being faithful. Never veering off the track. And they can be bolder. Because they can stand with such a clear conscience. Look with me at Psalm 40. It's written by David. I want you to look at the first three verses with me. Psalm 40 verse 1 says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear, and shall trust in the Lord. That last half of verse 3 is a promise that God has given me. That as I go forward and share this testimony in humility, that the, the last half of verse 3 says, Many will see it, this new song God's put in my heart. And they will fear and trust in the Lord. I've been praying previously prior to coming to this city that God would let people see what he's done in my life and they too would trust in the Lord for salvation they'd turn from their, the way they're living and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and others today no doubt in this, as I share this testimony God's going to speak to you about areas of your life you need to trust in the Lord possibly you have unsaved loved ones that you've been praying for for a long time but tonight they're no closer to the kingdom of God than the first prayer you breathed and you know what I see happening many times? Many moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, they just become so consumed with the grief because that child is not living for God. They really stop praying effectively. They just grieve and fret over that one. They're not really praying in faith. Oh, they want them to come to know Christ. But they just fret rather than pray in faith. And I've been praying, especially for some of you tonight, that God will put new hope and faith in your heart to believe for their salvation. I'm going to ask you one more time to bow your head with me and pray. 
I'm going to say things tonight that many of you have no idea. And this message tonight is for you if you're five or 95. And I'm going to ask you to do just like I said this morning. Would you open up your heart right now and say, God, speak to me. God, do you have something for me tonight? Let's talk to him for just a minute. Heavenly Father, help me to deliver this message tonight. And Father, I pray especially for those that are hurting tonight that these words would put hope in their heart. God, around these altars, bring healing, I pray. In Jesus' name, I know I'm asking it according to your will. Amen. Amen. When I was, when I became pregnant, when my mother became pregnant with me, I didn't become pregnant. She was really unhappy. She didn't want to have me. It's not that she didn't like children. She already had two, my older brother and older sister. But she didn't want to bring a third child into the world because her husband, my father, was an alcoholic. He was more of a binger, actually, than an alcoholic. He would go weeks and weeks at a time drinking, and then he would stop. My mother started dating my father when she was 20 years old against her mother and father's will. My grandmother and grandfather told her not to date him, let alone become engaged to him. My mother believed that my mother was a fine Christian. My father was not. My mother believed that lie of the devil that so many teenagers believe today. That lie that says, why don't you go ahead and marry him? Maybe you'll win him to Jesus Christ. I tell young people everywhere I go, God wants them to date and to marry those that know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And instead of saying it in a preaching way, if you'll just be faithful to God, he's got somebody special for you. My mother and father were married for 44 years, and never one time in 44 years did my father ever walk into a church service nor accept Christ as Savior. I want to say it one more time loud and clear. God wants you to date and to marry those that know Jesus Christ as their Savior. After I was one year old, we moved into a neighborhood on the east side of Houston, Texas. Obviously, I didn't know at the time, but it was one of the most drug-infested neighborhoods in that city. And as I grew up there on the east side of Houston, it just seemed like the natural thing for me to do as I grew up as a young boy to become involved with narcotics. All of my friends took drugs, and I just chimed right in. By age 17, I had taken just about every known narcotic there was on the market. Marijuana, LSD, heroin, just, you name it, I'd taken it. One day, a group of friends of mine were out, we were all out swimming out at the San Jacinto River, right outside Houston, Texas, taking drugs, swimming out into the river there, and all of a sudden, high on drugs, we decided we were going to swim all the way across that wide San Jacinto River. We took our shirts off, and I feel like taking mine off now. I think I will. Not my shirt, but I'd like to take my coat off if you don't mind. And we got no farther than maybe just the fourth or the fifth pew back. And one of my friends, J.J., went under. I saw him going under, and I'll never forget as I reached out to my friend, but I missed him. I came back up for air. My friends all alerted what had happened. They started diving, but we never found my friend. We started screaming his name out into that black night. All you could see along the river was just little lights from the houses along the river. We never found him. After some time, we called the police. They came. And they asked us a lot of questions. After some time, they let us go. We came back the next morning, and right when we arrived, they had just found my friend J.J. I'll never forget, as I looked at my dead friend being lifted up out of the water, they laid him in a little boat over to the side. He was as straight as this altar rail I'm standing in front of. Three days later, I was a pallbearer at J.J.'s funeral. 
And I couldn't wait. I wanted to sit that casket down. I wanted to go home and put some drugs in my system to hide the pain and confusion I was going through. And that's exactly what me and my friends did. We all congregated at one friend's house and started taking uh, barbiturate narcotics, marijuana, drinking, trying to hide the pain we were going through. A concerned mother saw us all there trying to drown our sorrows. And she had recently heard about an organization called Teen Challenge. How many heard of Teen Challenge? Most everybody. And then feeling the leadership of the Holy Spirit as she called Teen Challenge and began to share with them where we were at and what all was involved. Then they came across the city and they came to where we were at and they sat down with us. And for three long hours they shared with us what it meant to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And you know, I had a lot of reasons why I didn't want to accept Jesus. I, as a young teenager, I'd been taken, by my, not a teenager, but as a young boy up until age 12, I had been taken to church every Sunday in a particular denominational church. Every time they'd preach on the hill, I'd go to the altar and shake the pastor's hand and sit on the front pew and fill out a card. But for some reason, I never could understand how it all worked together. I never understood that you serve God because you love him. And because I never could serve him because I love him, there never was any lasting relationship between me and him. I'm surprised how many older adults never learn to serve God because they love him. That night, to make a long story short, all my friends and myself bowed our heart and head and accepted Christ into our life. That night I knew I was saved. I knew something had happened in me. I knew something had happened for no other reason. I reached in my pockets and I took all the drugs I had. And I gave them to the Teen Challenge personnel. In return, they gave me a whole stack of tracks. And I took those tracks and I tucked them underneath my arm and I marched to high school the next day and I started passing out these papers telling everybody what Jesus had done in my life. My friends did the same. Revival broke out in that little community of ours. Some 75 to 100 young people accepted Jesus over the next few days. But because of my home life, my father a heavy drinker, other brothers and sisters on drugs, I needed a place to, where I could get away from society. And I entered into the Teen Challenge program. I went through the Teen Challenge program there in Houston and was transferred to phase two of the program at Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And their life was so fresh for me. Here I was a city boy, born and raised in Houston all my life. Now, living on this several hundred acre farm there in Cape Girard in a very large Teen Challenge facility. I went through the Teen Challenge program and because I was humble before God and I had such a desire to know Him, I became the first young man to come on board as a staff member after completing the program without having to go off to college or get a job to prove himself. I worked as a staff member at Teen Challenge for one year, and then one day God opened up the door for me to go to Bible College in Springfield, Missouri. I mean, he really opened up the door. Room and board paid for, tuition paid for, money to spend, books, everything. That's what you call God really opening up the door. And I'll never forget, driving on that Highway 60 from Cape Girardeau, almost 300 miles away to Springfield, walking onto the campus of Central Bible College and putting my bags down looking at all those buildings. To me, it was like I was on some mammoth university. I realize now it's not quite that big, but it was big to me in those days. As I looked around at those buildings, all I could think about just a couple of years before, there I was a doper on the streets of Houston. Now here I am going to Bible College. And I took to that college like a fish to water. I wanted to be a man of God. And I was so humble. I'd spend many hours in prayer. I'd read God's Word. I wanted to know God. It was January 1974. After that semester was over, I was asked to come and head up an evangelistic team in southeast Missouri in southern Illinois. I accepted other young college students working with me. We would go into different cities and, and have rallies. And using the Assembly of God Church as a hub, we would have big rallies. And we saw hundreds of, of young people say that summer. Every city we went into, God was blessing. We saw young people's groups go from zero to 50. 
20 to 100. Every city we went to, God was blessing. But that summer, something happened that was going to change my life for the worst for several years to come. That summer, Ken Wilson left the closet of prayer and the things that he wanted to do and started lifting up himself. Oh, I wasn't walking around saying, look at me, look how great I am. But my heart was saying it. Look at me. Look what God is doing with me. I tell people everywhere I go, whether it's being a deacon of a church or teaching a Sunday school class, God doesn't need us. He's the vine with the branches. He falls through us to get the job done or doesn't get done. But it's so easy when God starts to use us and think we're so indispensable. We're so important to God. And like all seeds of pride, unless they're repentant of, they'll grow. And before long, not only was I committing the sin of pride, you know, while I'm on that pride thing, and I'm, I'm going to get off of it, I'm sure, before this revival's over. But have you ever thought about this? We always, when we hear about Jimmy Baker or somebody like that committing adultery, well, we get all up in arms about it. And it's a bad thing. But have you ever thought about what God, what's the top sin on his list? Pride. Of the seven things God hates, right at the top of the list is pride. Not adultery. Back to the testimony. I was committing other sins. I went back to Bible college. Two weeks before the semester was out, me and four of the young men had been caught drinking alcohol and smoking marijuana there on campus. All five of us were called in and sat down in the dean's office. We were given a good talking to, and all five of us were suspended. Dean Curse kept me sitting there as the other four men left. He looked at me and said, Ken, I know you're past. I'd like to, like to let you stay, but I can't do it. I've got to let you go. And I've said many times it wouldn't have mattered if he would have let me stay because just like the book of Proverbs talks about the transgressor in heart shall be filled with his own way. And I was filled with my own way. And I say that for another reason because I meet people everywhere I go trying to make other people turn their life to God. You can bend your back over trying to help somebody, but until that individual is willing to stop the sins they're committing and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, you can just really wear yourself out. Oh, you don't stop praying for them. It's God's Spirit that draws them to Jesus. But they've got to be willing to stop the sins they're committing. I left that campus with already a hard heart, and I started committing petty crimes one after another. Eventually, I wound up in Houston, Texas, where for the first time in my life, I became a hardcore heroin addict. I was not a weekend drug addict or a closet dope fiend, but every waking day of my life, all I wanted to do was shoot another shot of dope, another shot of dope, another To this day, I've injected hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of opiate narcotics into my veins. I've got scars on my arms inches long where I've injected thousands and thousands of dirty hypodermic needles into my arms. I lived like that month after month, year after year, going in and out of methadone clinics. I know what methadone is. Not too many. Methadone is a narcotic that the government or, or the state dispenses for heroin addiction. It, they say it's a cure for heroin addiction, but believe me, it's just a substitute. And I drink this methadone, and it would suffice to where I could build my body up. As you're looking at me now, I weigh about 178 pounds. In those days, I would go down to as little as 140, 150 pounds. And I'd go in these methadone clinics, and I'd drink this methadone where it would suffice, and go right back out and tear my body down again. I lived like this month after month, year after year. We were living in Missouri. During this time, I had gotten married to a fine wife. She attended the Assembly of God Church at Cape Girardeau when I was working at Teen Challenge. I met her there as I would go to church on Sunday. She's never taken drugs to this day. She's never smoked, never drank. But yet, because of my sin, she was having to go through all of this also. We were living at Cape Girardeau, just south of there. 
There I contracted one of the worst opiate narcotics addictions I'd ever had. I was injecting dilaudid intravenously into my arms, large quantities of it. And with that addiction, I wound up at the state hospital in Farmington, Missouri. And there I had some of the best psychiatrists and psychologists come to me. They were going to straighten me out. But I knew nothing short of getting on my knees somewhere before God and saying, God, forgive me of my sins, was going to straighten me out. And I'm saying that for a reason, too, because I meet so many people as I travel around running here and there trying to find some answer to their problem. When all the time the root of the thing is sin, surely we need some counseling, we need some direction. But unless it's God's word that gives biblical counseling, there'll never be a change needed for a person to be a new person in Christ. I left that hospital and they wrote across my papers all those trained personnel, secular personnel, convalescent status, will live the life of a parasite the rest of his life. And you know what? I believe that lie of the devil. I left that hospital. I left my family in southeast Missouri and I headed for Houston where heroin was plentiful. And by now I needed so much money to survive those little petty crimes I was committing wasn't enough. So for the first time in my life, I became involved with armed robbery. It started off real simple, walking into a store with a gun, taking the money, and going to the local drug connection, spending the money there. Then every few days, another robbery, another robbery, another robbery, another robbery, till the tune I had committed dozens and dozens and dozens of armed robberies. By now, my conscience had become seared. It seemed like I got like a high iron. I had no feeling for anybody. All I could think about was another shot of dope, another shot of dope. After living like that for almost one year, one day trying to purchase narcotics in the Fifth Ward area of Houston, an all-black area. Guns came in my head from all directions. I was apprehended by police and put in back of a squad car and taken downtown. And I'd been in back of a squad car like that many times in my life, 13 times to be exact. That's how many times I'd been arrested. But as I got in the back of the squad car that I knew that somehow mama or nobody else was going to get me out of this one. And I got downtown and I went through all those lineups. You know how they do four, five, six people looking at some suspects. Somebody say, yeah, he's the one that did it. I went through a number of lineups for about a two to three day period. I was guilty of every lineup I stood in line for. Another case I had jumped bond on some months before. I pled guilty to the charges because I was guilty. They set the court dates. My lawyer prepared my case. My wife flew from Cape Girardeau to Houston with my little daughter. She had just turned four. She's 15 now. They sat in the courtroom and went along with my mother, my father, and many other family members who were hoping that somehow... I would get 10 years suspended sentence. But when the gavel came down, I was sentenced to two five-year sentences in the Texas Department of Corrections. And as I stood before the judge that day receiving my sentence, you would think there would be remorse in my heart, but I hadn't changed. I could hear my mother crying behind me, my father, unsaved as he was, my wife, but the only thing going through my mind that day was how long is this going to take me to get through this? They initially would not let me touch my wife. I had not seen her for a few weeks. They ushered, finally they let me talk to her. They ushered me off to a side room and they handcuffed my wrists to the arms of a chair. As I looked across at my weeping wife and my puzzled little four-year-old daughter, and to make matters worse, my wife told me when we were together just a few weeks before, before I was arrested. At that time when we were together, she had gotten pregnant with my third and final child, my only son. That son was born while I was in prison. I want you to hear me tonight. That wasn't a pretty sight at all. But when I sin or you sin, we don't just hurt ourselves. We hurt all those around us. 
I left that courtroom that day, and three days later, three days after that, I was ushered off to prison in Huntsville, Texas. And you got to realize this was in 1978-79. This is before the government came in and made Texas do something about their overcrowdedness. Instead of one man in each one of those little cells, there were three of us living in each one of those little five by nine cells. We lived like packed stuffed animals. One year went by. I came up for parole. I was denied. Another year went by. It sounds easy to say these years went by, but they just seemed to drag and drag and drag. And you know something? Every once in a while during those two years, about four, five, six times during those two years, I would go to church every once in a while. I have church in prison. And I'd sit there. And you know, I knew Jesus Christ died on the cross. But I was so filled with my own way. I knew the way to really have peace was to die to self. But I still wanted to do things my own way. I'll never forget that second year in prison. A young man today, he serves in a similar of God evangelist. Was in that prison. Had been there for almost eight years at that time. He, knowing that I had some similar of God background, he came and bought me a Pentecostal evangel. I, I couldn't wait to get that evangel back to my cell. I, I didn't want to start reading his stories. I turned to the back of it. You know, like some of you do, where all the evangelists are listed in the pastors. And I went down the list at men that I had known in Bible college. They were out there preaching revivals, pastoring churches. I'd see the man, and I said, Oh, that's so and so. He, he lived at Three East, just right down the hall from me. As I began to look at these men that I once was in Bible college with, the devil whispered one more time, loud and clear in my ear, you're washed up. You'll never amount to anything. And one more time, I believe that lie of the devil. After serving two years in prison, I was released on parole. And you think after being in a Texas prison for two years, where any time anybody comes to visit you, you can't touch them. You have to visit through a little bit of screen. You can hardly hear them talk because it's so noisy in there. They weren't on telephones. You could phone home. You think that they're living in those conditions for two years? I'd finally learned my lesson. But you see, my heart hadn't changed. And instead of getting out of that prison and going back to my family, I got out of that prison and I went right back to that hellhole in Houston, Texas. And this time I was driven like a madman. In just a few short days out of prison, I was back shooting dope like there was no tomorrow. In just a few weeks out of prison, I was back addicted to the methadone. For the first time in my life, I had a dual habit, drinking the methadone daily and shooting heroin daily. In just a few months out of prison, I'd gotten to place I'd become so evil, no one on the face of the earth wanted anything to do with me. Not preachers that were praying for me. Many of them that had known me had been praying, fasting for years. Not people in churches that had been praying. Not even my own family. And one day, like the proverbial prodigal son, I had spent it all. Everything I'd ever owned, automobiles, anything, I'd sold to put narcotics into my veins. And one day, walking the streets of Houston, Texas, with nothing but the clothes on my back, like a bum I had no place to lay my head with a dollar bill and some quarters in my pocket I passed the pay phone and I decided that I would try to give my mother a call you need to understand just a few days before I had taken a large sum of money from my mother every dime she owned and as I picked up the phone to call my mother, some of you moms and dads, you need to hear me right now. As soon as she heard my voice, she said, boy, don't you ever call this house again. I believe you would sell your very soul to the devil for a shot of dope. Kaplunk. 
she hung up the phone. I tell you, my friend, I've been cut, hit, shot, but that day that pierced me through my heart when my mother rejected me. But it was the best thing she could have ever done. Oh, today my mother supports me every month substantially. She comes to revival. She's flying to Houston this Saturday to be with me, and I'll be down there. I see her all the time. And we talked about that night more than once. She said, son, you'll never know that night when I hung up that phone with you how it broke my heart to do that. I walked these floors in this house all night long, crying my eyes, praying that God would turn you around.